Again, I thank you for inviting me here to share the Word of God with you on a fairly regular basis. Uh, it's a little bit, a little bit heavy part that I'm not just subbing for my friend Jimmy who happens to be out of town, hmm. but who, with his family, I learned from Nancy's um, blog. She does have a blog called longforhim.blogspot.com, where they had arrived yesterday in Jakarta, Indonesia. And it's for real. They're there. And we all remember them fondly and in our prayers. I know my family and I will miss them dearly. Well, for the living of these days, I'd like us to focus on the very first uh, sentence of that epistle reading from Ephesians chapter 5, where we find Paul writing this Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise, making the most of the time, because the days are evil. Making the most of the time. Making the most of your time, or of my time. As you know, by now my full-time position presently is a New York City public high school teacher. I teach in a community in Brooklyn known as Bushwood. Some of you will nod and know that. Others, if you are not familiar with Bushwick, it is, well, what they call a high needs neighborhood. And that's a Department of Ed slang for it's a rough neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's a tough place where recently there have been some uh, uh, slayings and, and difficulties uh, with gang and drug violence. My school is in the middle of that. And in case you were wondering, I love teaching there. I am in my seventh year of it, and I wouldn't change for another school. It's a challenging place, and it has its uh, big frustrations. But there's also a sense of, of urgency and ministry and reward that's tied in with working there. Well, this summer, I just finished uh, this past week teaching summer school. Uh, they kind of needed somebody, and I was planning on not teaching from school, but I let them talk me into it. And uh, for the past few weeks, I've taught what's called an ESL enrichment class. Mm -hmm. English is a second language. For enrichment only, that is, this class held no, no grade and no credit. It was not a class for those who had failed my class during the regular school year but was simply a class designed uh, to enrich the students, to give them uh, a leg up in their English, to help them uh, overcome more of the barriers to understanding and using the language so they could well, also do math and social studies and science and all the other subjects, and hopefully be uh, prepared for college. So the payoff, at least for the student, was not credit or grade, but personal enrichment. Now, need I ask uh, how that went over with them? How do I convince them to come to class when the only carrot is you'll appreciate it for yourself? Mm -hmm. uh, where the only incentive to come is self-improvement and reward? Well, fortunately, we had enough come day by day uh, to sustain a class for the past several weeks, the past month. And uh, the ones that uh, didn't want to come because there was no credit or grade, well, then they just continued with their summer vacation. But I was thinking of the parallel between that and, and the Christian life as it's laid out by Paul and, and particularly in this, pas in this passage, that we live the Christian life, do we not? Not for the sake of credit, we're not doing this to earn something, to get, as an old phrase used to put it, stars in our crown. We're not doing this by any means, living the Christian life, striving to follow Jesus' teachings. We're not doing it in order to gain God's favor or his, his love or his appreciation because the gospel tells us we've got that all through Christ. So then, since there's no grade or no credit for living the Christian life, why are we doing it? 
Why are we bothering to worship, to learn the scriptures, to live the scriptures, to make choices that are positive and not negative? Why are we doing it? Well, the payoff, as I mentioned to the kids about taking summer English, is personal. It's so that we can be prepared and better equipped to live in a world that is not always in accord with the will of God. So that we might be those who are careful, that is, who live with care, with self-conscious recognition that this world belongs to God. Living as wise people, because the days, as Paul writes here, are evil. That is, since Christ came, the price for our salvation, since the issue of our acceptance for, with God is already settled, then we have now the privilege to live that Christian life as a means of preparation for the fullness of life as God is going to unfold it in the future. Not only our personal futures, but the future of the whole world. To live as if the kingdom of God were already in full swing. Although it has started in Christ and is slowly growing, it is something that we can show the world that is different from the way the world operates. And that's why Paul writes, not as unwise people, but as wise. Making the most of the time. Because the days are evil. Three short things as we ponder this passage and, and pull together some of what, what he's teaching us for today. What this scripture has to say to you and me uh, now and the present. And the first is he talks about a, a negative thing. He says here, for the days are evil. The obvious part of that, I think we already know. I certainly am one who, as a, in my course of ministry, uh, do not like to harp on all the bad things that are happening in the world. I suspect most of us know that, and most of us can recite the list of what's going on in places like Bushwick, what's going on in Afghanistan, of uh, all the troubles, uh, all the unrest, the exceeding increase of violence, senseless violence, all the things. Uh, I'd rather not harp on, but we just remind ourselves that, yeah, Thanks for good out And neither was it in Paul's day. It was hardly any different. Violence and disrespect, wars and rumors of wars were all around. Crime was with humanity ever since Cain did in Abel. And that is something that we, we live with on a daily basis. And sometimes we'd like to just shut out of our minds uh, just to get a point. But there's another aspect to that word evil, the days of evil, that I'd like to share with you. That maybe is a little closer to home, not quite as, as stark as the evening news or what you read on the internet. And, and I'm reminded of that uh, on Wednesday. Wednesday was the last day of summer school. The last day I had to get up at uh, um, yeah, 6.30 in the morning. <laughs> And so I got up, uh, well, it was a day after a particularly bad set of thunder thunderstorms on Pusa. Walked down to my car, everything's hunky dory, I'm looking forward to being off for the next two and a half weeks. I could relax, do some stuff at home, sketch out some preaching plans for a lot of church. And what do I see but uh, my car with a shattered windshield and a tree limb busted in two pieces over each side of the front end with my front, one of my front headlights snatched out, and a dent in my hood is uh, big enough to put a bowl of soup in. Uh -huh. And it's like, oh, yeah. Just what I need to see at 7.35. <laughs> a tree limb had come down, and it broke in just the way you were on. You break the stick over our knee, except the knee was the front end of my 2010 Subaru. The thing's not even old enough yet for me to not care. <laughs> you know how that is, you get an old enough car, it's like, um, the insurance is not worth the trouble. Well, it was still drivable, when I say shattered windshield, the glass was crazed, but it was not compromised, it didn't have a hole in it, which meant I could get in and I could draw it and it broke them. So, when Paul talks about the days of evil, our evil, that word evil can refer to crimes and all the horrible things that I don't like to harp about from the whole day. And it can also refer to the stuff that you and I encounter on a day-by-day -day basis. It can refer to those troubles and those setbacks. You know, 
calling insurance, setting it up with the police, getting, uh, getting the rental that, so I could get it in time so I could drive up here, uh, and all that stuff. And then not to mention that Saturday, yesterday, we had a party planned for my daughter's uh, kind of going away party. So she's going to college in California. Uh, and how am I going to prepare for that? And so she and I are in Costco. And as I'm looking at this, some of you, you know Costco has got all those big shelves and boxes and stuff. I put a five pound, I'm looking at the label of a five pound jug of, of barbecue sauce. I put it back on the shelf, but on the, on the oh, no. cardboard, it's on the edge of the shelf. It comes down and I got sweet baby rays all over my oh, no. head. And I'm thinking, God, what, what are we doing here? Or are, you me, <laughs> are you giving me stories so I can share them on Sunday? <laughs> Because he walked through it too. Because 
he faced the troubles and trials of life, even to being falsely accused and sentenced uh, to a cruel death on the cross, because he overcame. One of my first favorite verses in the scripture out of the, uh, the book of John is Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In other words, I died, but through the glorious power of God, he also rose again. And when he rose again, he completely triumphed over all the bad things that could happen, whether they are evil things, uh, truly evil things, or simply the bad things that occur in this world. So that we might be those who follow Christ even in the worst of circumstances. And know that, yes, he is there with me. I do not need to freak out. I, I do not need to find a solution in something that is harmful or less honorable. I can find my, my satisfaction in Christ. Jesus said in our gospel lesson, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. And that the bread that I give for the world, the life of the world, is my flesh. Christ gives himself to you and to me so that we can withstand, that is, we can stand against all these things that might come against us, either personally or in the world around us. Or as we look at the way society is going and things, it, it can put us into a kind of negative framework. And I think sometimes, with some justification, we Christians are often accused of having a negative mindset. But that isn't actually the case. The case is, Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And so the, the third and final thing then that Paul is establishing for us as we, as we meditate on this passage, he says, be filled with the Spirit. As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Like I told the kids, there's a song in our heart that can counter even the most severe of trials. There's a song in our heart that goes something like this. Christ has conquered death. Christ has conquered Satan. Christ's kingdom is forever. And forever am I a part of that kingdom because I belong to him. And if that's the only song in our heart, though our outside appearance may be very sad or even depressed, that our circumstances might be like Job's, where our whole world comes crashing down, or just merely inconvenienced by a tree limb or by insufficient funds in the bank. Christ is there with us, strengthening us that we might still have a song in our heart that says, I belong to him and he belongs to me and that I am forever a part of his kingdom. It means being filled with the Spirit and where it says they're singing and making melody in your hearts to one another in songs, hymns, and spiritual songs I take that as a, a kind of a, a, a metaphor, a use of language. Paul isn't saying, saying that at coffee hour we should all start singing praise hymns to each other. But what he's actually getting at is that in our hearts, we're here because we all know, whether we say it out loud or not, that Jesus is in charge, that his kingdom is forever, and that it is working right now, even in this world, that seems to be so filled with evil and with reversals. It is God who calls us into that life of joy. That is not a, a plastic smile. As you get to know me, uh, I, I do have one fault. You might as well know it now. I usually don't smile for pictures. Hmm. So okay, if I'm at a picnic or whatever, or a function, and my first instinct when you pull the camera to my face is, is to go, 
Let us pray. 